This is the timeline of Cabrini Green, the most notorious projects in Chicago. It goes all the way back to the 1850s. In the 1850s, it was shanties built on a low-lying land along the Chicago River, and the population was mostly Swedish and Irish. The area was called Little Hill, you know, because it was like a gas refinery nearby, and it was like shooting pillars of flame and fumes and stuff coming up out of there. So by the 20th century, it was known as Little Sicily due to a whole bunch of Italian folk moved up in there. For y'all that don't know, man, you know, Chicago is one of the main hubs of, um, you know, the Italian mafia. That's where Al Capone, you know, that's where he did uh, most of his dirt at. This whole gang culture in Chicago, <laughs> it ain't nothing new, baby. They have been doing that way back. In 1929, some uh, Harvey Zarbo wrote this book called The Gold Coast and the Slums, a sociological study of Chicago's near north side. And this was talking about the difference between the wealthy folks of the Gold Coast and the poor folks up in Little Sicily in the transitional area in between. Marshall Field Garden Apartments, the first large scale, Although funded through private charity, low-income housing development in the area is completed. Now, this really blew my mind because Marshall Fields was like, I always knew it as like a mall or something in Chicago, a store or something like that. Kind of like um, J.C. Penney or something. That's the way I always thought about it. I didn't know that was a like a rich family in Chicago, and they basically built this neighborhood and put a retail in it and everything, so... They was trying to see if they could make these like super, like um, just these super little neighborhoods and sad little super cities inside the cities. But it turned out that they couldn't, it wasn't low income because all the work they put into it, they had to charge too much money, you know, for folk to stay up in there to make their money back that they, you know, built the place on. So, you know, I guess... This project project was a fail for the poor folks, but it was a win for the big dogs, I guess. Now, in 1942, Francis Cabrini Homes, two-story row houses with 586 units and 54 buildings by architect Holman's Burmeister and something else is completed. Now, the initial regulations stipulate 75% was white and 25% black. So they had an idea, like, I guess they had to say we had to at least get 25% of this um, homes to be black people. Now, this was named for St. Francis Cabrini, an Italian-American nun who served the poor and was the first American to be canonized. Now, that is unbelievable. Like, I grew up in Chicago. And I've been to Cabrini Green once or twice. I had no idea it was named after a nun. Like, that is amazing. That's just, that's, that's crazy. Wow. Now, in 1957, Cabrini Homes Extension, the red brick buildings, mid and high rises, they was built with 1,900, I mean, 1,925 units and 15 buildings by architect something Epstein and Sons. Wow. Man, think about that. 1,925 units. Whew. In 1962, they built the William Green, real William Green Homes. 1,096 units by architect Pace Associates, named for William Green, longtime president of the American Federation of Labor. You know, I couldn't imagine somebody building something that housed that many people in my name. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know, man, I, maybe he, I don't know if he was dead at the time or not, but... That's a lot, man. I couldn't imagine so many people living under my name. If it was under my name, I'd have some kind of like, some kind of little secret special deal. It'd be like, pay your rent on time and get free Kool-Aid. <laughs> or every apartment come with a barbecue grill out on the patio. <laughs> now, 
1966, Gottrell et al. versus Chicago Housing Authority, a lawsuit alleging that Chicago public housing program was conceived and executed in a racially discriminatory manner that perpetuated racial segregation within neighborhoods is filed. The CHA, the Chicago Housing Authority, was found liable in 1969, and a consent decree with HUD was entered in 1981. So basically, they were saying for y'all to build, the, you know, these um, projects, y'all built these with the intention of, look, man, let's put all the Negroes, let's put all the black folk, let's put all of whatever they wanted to call them, let's put them all in one place. Lock them up, throw away the key, basically. You know, we ain't going to put no resources in there. We ain't putting no good hospitals. We not putting no good schools, no good jobs, no good grocery. You know, we not doing none of that. Just lock them in, put them in there, shut the dang door, and let's get the heck on. Get them out of our problem. You know, out of our face. It ain't our problem. February 8th. 1974 television sitcom good times you know set in cabrini green you know they didn't never say the name cabrini but when the show came on they showed the projects on the camera or whatever and if you know a bunch of shots and stuff in the opening credits and the closing credits debuted on cbs and it ran for six seasons until august 1st 1979 now for y'all that don't know Good Times is a show that still holds up to this day. <laughs> like, Good Times is just a part of my childhood. Me and my brothers and my mama, whatever, we still reference, like, Good Times, man. Good Times will forever be a part of our lives. And I can't wait till one day when my kids grow up, we sit down and we watch episodes of Good Times together. And even though they probably going to think it's the lamest thing ever, but... You know, hopefully they just see what life used to be like. And the main lesson in the whole show was even though, you know, things was bad, they was able to have good times in the midst of all the craziness. And for all y'all who fans of the show, Bookman just died, man. You know, R.I.P. to Bookman, man. Um, you know, R.I.P. to Bookman, man. Yeah. You know, that's, I wish they could have done some kind of, you know, uh, reunion show, but I know, you know, Florida gone, and, you know, but, um, hey, man, R.I.P. to all of the great sitcom legends, man. March 26, 19, March 26th through April 19th, 1981, Mayor Jane Byrne moves into the Green Green to prove a point regarding Chicago's high crime rate. Considered a publicity stunt, she stays just three weeks. Now, um, I'm going to have to, you know, I I felt like I heard this before. You know, I it's like one of the things I think I heard and I forget. But I'm going to have to do a video to um, go into detail about that. Because, you know, I know it got to be <laughs> something behind it. I'm going to have to do a video about this on its own. So tune in, like, um, you know, come, I'm probably going to do this by next week. I'm going to touch on this subject again because that's uh, that's interesting, man. And um, I'm going to really have to break that down. It would be nice to see more things like this from politicians, you know, not just uh, showing up or whatever to take some pictures, but just come be part of it for a minute. You know, maybe bring some of them people from other sides of town and let them come be part of some stuff for a little day or two, even a day. Just come for a day and see what it's like. Nineteen ninety-two, Candyman is released. The story taking place at the housing project. Now, for y'all that don't know, Candyman took place. And Cabrini Green. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's amazing that just how, you know, his, just how historical this place is, man. You know, that to, you know, that's, that's, that's amazing. It's, you know, I'm sure it's, it's not the only movie shot in the projects. But to me, what place would have just, you know, what, what place would have such a, 
a better violent history, man. Like, you know, if ghost is real and if demon possession and all that stuff is real, wouldn't it happen in a place where so many people die, so many people suffer, so much, you know, injustice is done? To me, it would only make sense, man. You see these little horror movies with ghosts and demon possession and stuff happening in the suburbs and all that and a big brand new house they just bought. But hey, man, <laughs> how is there so many restless spirits in the suburbs? What, they they, they grew up with the, the silver spoon in their mouth was, was too sharp or something? Nineteen ninety four. Chicago receives one of the first Hope uh six it's a it's a Roman numeral VI, that's six, right? Hope six housing opportunities for people everywhere. Grants to develop Cabrini Green as a mixed income neighborhood. Hmm. So from a low income to a mixed income. I wonder how that worked out. Spoiler alert, not very good. <laughs> September 27, 1995, Demolition Begins. I know it's a lot of people that probably was like, yeah, man, it's time for this place to go. But I know it's a lot of people that was real, you know, even just looking at, you know, these images, man. Like, people was like, don't tear our home down, fix our home, man. And if you really think about it, man, for y'all that don't really know, this was part of gentrification, man. So that meant that we finna tear this junk down and in replacement of it, we gonna build some stuff up that's too expensive for y'all. So you're gonna go out to areas where it's cheaper to live and more congested and more crime because now everybody taking all the jobs up. Everybody living shoulder to shoulder. And, hey, man, you're going to get, you know, cities like Chicago is going to turn into the wild, wild west, just like it did. 1997. Chicago unveils Near North Redevelopment Initiative, a master plan for development in the area. It recommends demolishing the green homes and most of the Cabrini extension. Yeah, man, they was getting ready to, you know, it was time for new beginnings, man. And time for uh, bad times for, you know, my folk. Nineteen ninety nine, Chicago Housing Authority announces a plan for transformation, which will spend one point five billion over ten years to demolish eighteen thousand apartments and build and or rehabilitate 25,000 apartments. Earlier redevelopment plans for Cabrini Green are included in the plan for transformation. New library, a rehabilitated Seward Park, and new shopping center open. Wow. You know, that's... It's a lot of people in Chicago, but... Man, that's... Just think of how much organization you gotta do to build something like that man. like it's hard just going to the grocery store and getting everything you need and not forgetting nothing man i just couldn't imagine coming up with a plan on a scale that big man it's like it just that blows my mind man i ain't that smart december 9th 2010 the William Green Homes Complex's last standing building closes. You know, that's kind of, man, that's sad, man. You know, I know Cabrini had a lot of bad go on in there, but I know it really displaced some people that probably was there their whole lives, man. And I know they had a lot of memories, and to see all that get torn down like that, I know it must really, you know, it had to really bother them, man. March 30th, 2011. The last high-rise building was demolished with a public art presentation commemorating the event. 
The majority of Francis Cabrini Holmes' row houses remain intact, although in poor condition, with some having been abandoned. Now, you know, nowadays the area, you know, it, it then came up some, you know, uh, you know, the people with money, they didn't get back up in there, because you know, that's how it all go. Back in the day, the folks who, you know, worked downtown and had the big jobs and stuff, they didn't want to stay in the city. They wanted to stay in the suburbs. So it was more expensive to stay in the suburbs and cheaper to stay in the city. But then they got tired of taking them long commutes and all that. And they ready to, you know, they got tired of it, man. So they said, we need to be closer to the city. So that's what they did. They came and they started getting the, getting them poor folks out the city so them rich folks could come in and, and just step right on in, man. I remember when I was in high school, I went past, I used to go past the Rockwell uh, projects. And uh, it was amazing, man, how just little by little, man, they was just tearing the, the old stuff down and putting them condos in. And even as a teenager, I knew that the Negroes weren't going to be able to afford to stay there. I already knew that, even as a kid, man. And I said, so you know the big dogs knew, but they don't care.